I'm just saying, I think sometimes we are a little bit too harsh on it. Yes, sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 187 of section 138. Raymil Tapia is a Toronto Blue Jay. The Blue Jays send Randall Grishik over to Colorado. Um, you know, we've, we know they've been trying to move him for months and months and years, but they finally get rid of Randall Grishik. That's a little bit harsh to Grishik, but they move him to Colorado to get Raymil Tapia in return, in addition to a minor league prospect. And the Blue Jays send cash as well to Colorado. Guys, how are you? How are you feeling about this deal? Doing good, Mark. You know, originally... Uh, I guess this kind of caught me off guard a little bit because uh, Rymel Tapia is a name that we haven't really heard of um, unfortunately, this offseason. So this kind of came out of nowhere. We knew the rumors of the Jays looking into an outfielder like Brett Gardner who can bat left. And there was other names out there. We've talked about Michael Conforto as well before. So, you know, putting the pieces together, the Jays are re- kind of rebranding their outfield depth with this move. They they shop out or send out Randall Gritchick, like you said. They bring in Rymel Tapia. So, not bad. I mean, a solid fourth outfielder, I think, is his role or his role will be on this team. And based off his numbers last year, uh, he played in a lot of games for the Rockies. So there's good parts to his game. There's some, you know, parts of weakness to his game. But overall, I really like the fit so far. And we're going to talk about it today. Yeah, and I got to say, like, you talk about this as just a bench role, but he can provide more than just come into the game or play every couple of days. Like, I was just looking, Ben Nicholson Smith put out a tweet this guy, like you can pretty much call this guy a super utility guy with all the things you can do, whether you want him to run DH or allow Springer or other guys to DH more. Like I think considering what Randall Grichik was to this team, and I don't mean this in any bad way, it's better to have a guy like Tapia here who can provide really what the Blue Jays need as a fourth outfielder and really just a solid bench piece. So as you can tell, I am a huge fan of this move. Yeah, and I think something that's being lost in all this is he is a left-handed hitter. In addition to just providing that, you know, whether it's equal offensive production to Randall Grishik or if you like to think it's slightly improved than what Randall Grishik offers, regardless, Remil Tapia is a left-handed hitter. And that's exactly what the Blue Jays have needed. We've been harping on it all offseason. So it's nice to see them finally make that move. And, you know, we just recently in our last episode talked about whether the blue Jays were done for the year in terms of off season, off season moves. It appears they weren't, it appears we were wrong. We thought they would kind of settle where they were, make a few minor moves, but other than that, they were done, but instead they go out, get Raymond Tapia. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, the big picture of it is that now they have a left-hander. Now they have a guy who arguably has better production in the outfield. And he's also a guy that's a little bit younger. He's 28 years old. Um, and I think that's a big part of this. He's a guy who maybe fits into the Blue Jays' competitive schedule a little bit more instead of, you know, relying on a guy like Randall Grishik. You have someone like Raymond Tapia who's going to be around for a couple of years. Grishik had a couple of years left on his contract. He was earning, I think it was $10 million, $11 million a year. Tapia is a lot cheaper. He's younger. He's got a little bit better offensive production. And the Blue Jays also get a minor league prospect with it. They get a guy named... Adrian Pinto, who we don't know a lot about. He didn't make the top 30 Rockies prospect list this past season, but um, a lot of people talking about why he is a good prospect, why the Blue Jays should be happy about getting him. Um, So lots of moving parts to this deal, lots going on, um, but it's an exciting time for the Blue Jays. I guess the question to you guys, now that we have this deal, are the Blue Jays done? Is this the final thing they needed to do? Because they do have that left-handed bat, they have that added outfield depth, although, you know, you're moving Grishik, so it's it's one for one. You're not actually adding depth there. You're still probably going to be relying on someone like Josh Palacios down the line if someone gets injured. Um, are they done now? Are they still in the market for relievers, for infielders? What does the offseason picture look like now that they have completed this deal? Well, I think the first thing we need to consider is how close the actual start of the season is because – March 24th is today. It's Thursday. So you have two weeks now or yeah, two weeks until the season starts till the blue Jays opening the season in uh, Toronto. I don't, well, well, two weeks total, but two weeks includes the days where like they're not actually playing, they're traveling and everything. So I would say they're probably done in terms of position players, like, and starting rotation. Now I don't think the starting rotation was going to be touched at all other than Kevin Gosman or after Kevin Gosman. 
the only thing I can really see them doing is maybe just adding bullpen depth or maybe not even depth, just taking in some type of older guy or really just any type of guy that we haven't heard about and saying, you know, come in, see what you can do in a week or two weeks in spring training. You have a shot at either making the opening day roster, opening the season in Buffalo or maybe New Hampshire, but I don't really think that there's anything else the team can do. I mean, except for internal options. And we had like a whole debate on this last time. The team, like there's a lot of guys pre-arbitration eligible, arbitration eligible, Teoscar Hernandez, you know, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. That's, I think, what the team's focus is now, is focusing on who they have within their system and either bringing them back, extending them, keeping them, things like that. Because really, like, unless you go out and, I don't know, get like Salvador Perez, you're not really going to improve your infield or something like that. And the same thing goes for your outfield. Like you, unless you, I guess, go make another blockbuster, you're not going to really improve your outfield. So I think the infield, the outfield's done. It's just in terms of bullpen, we will probably see things. And I remember, I think it was Francisco Liriano last year was a pretty, I think it was a pretty late move or late acquisition. Didn't end up making the team, didn't end up staying in the system, but something like that, where you bring him, see what you can get. Maybe he opens the season with, either you know if it's a younger guy with the minor league team or the majors or if it's an older guy the majors or you get rid of them but in terms of actual moves the big moves are done and I can't remember somebody mentioned this a couple weeks ago or or whatnot but in terms of improvements you're now just looking at incremental movements like you're not going to go out and get a guy that's in theory going to help you win an extra five games like that's not going to happen that's already been done and realistically, I don't think that there's any other acquisitions you can do that would actually provide that that type of improvement. Now it's just who can you potentially bring in that will help you incrementally. And I think at this point, it's just, it's safe to say that that's just bullpen. And even bullpen specifically, I'm not even talking about late inning guys because the core four is back from last season. And now it's just who can you bring in maybe to throw two innings, three innings, four innings if you're your starting pitcher gets rocked, but even that, like you have fairly decent uh, starting pitching depth, especially with the Kikuchi signing. So all in all, yes, I think they're done except for the few little needle in the haystack type situations where you get somebody who can add to your team, but it's not going to break the bank or really be any type of breaking news situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... It's tough to say because, you know, we all thought they were obviously done here and then they come out and do this move. But, you know, I think I'll leave the door open a little bit more than you, Jacob. I think that there is still a legitimate chance they may get something done. Now, I don't know if it's exactly going to be before opening day, but of course it opens the door for many more moves down the line. And of course, we all know the one player that everyone wants, and maybe that'll be revisited in July. But in terms of, I guess, adding one more player before opening day, I won't rule it out. I don't think it's likely, but I don't think it's impossible. I think a lot of this move really opens the door though, for them to do a lot more because Mark, you were mentioning the salary that officially the Jays are now, I assume getting majority or I guess getting rid of majority of it. They're sending over cash as well as Randall Gritchick. And he was set to make 9.3 million this year and next year. So that money's pretty much off the books now, or at least majority of it is. And then obviously uh, Toppy is making, I think 3 million or something like that. So it's a, pretty big difference what you're doing here so the thing here I also you know another reason why I think they may do something else or you can't rule it out is because as much as Gritchick and a lot of people can make the argument that Gritchick is in some ways a better hitter I guess production wise and whatnot we all know he's got power compared to Tapia and there's a lot more other there's a lot of other things that Gritchick does better than him in terms of advanced stats if you want to look down all of it but the one thing that makes this trade good for the Jays it's, it's about the fit and it's about the role on this team. Randall Gritchick is a fourth outfielder. As much as it wasn't ideal seeing him play every day last year because of the Springer injury, I think bringing somebody in like Tapia makes is so much better for the team's role because obviously the left-handed at bat, he's an outfielder, he's got speed, he can do a lot of things. And I think his DRS last year was eight. So he can also field the ball off. He has lack, lack of experience though in center field. So that's the one thing where um, a little bit of a question mark to see how they're going to handle that. Do they maybe make Teoscar Hernandez take more reps when Springer is not in center field? We'll uh, pretty much questions will eventually find out down the line, but that's really why I like this trade as much as, you can argue that the Jays are not as good of a team as they were with Randall Gritchick because people are making that argument. But the thing with Tapia, again, is that he does a lot of things well. And if you look at his on-base percentage, 
I think it was like 327. So this guy gets on base a lot. And the one thing too, is his strikeout percentage is really low. Um, I believe he's up in the 96th percentile in terms of striking out. So he's one guy that's really tough to strike out against. So because of all that, when you add it all up, uh, we're all, the one thing also you got to take away from this is we, it's become very clear and dependent that George Springer has to be healthy this year, because if there's a situation like last year where he goes down and the Jays have no choice, but to roll with somebody like Tapia for that amount of time, it's not ideal. It's far from ideal uh, because of that role. So Tapia here viewed as a fourth outfielder viewed as the guy that can steal bases. He stole 20 bases last year. It's a really good fit for the Jays and it's really what they needed. So as much as they have that now on their bench by bringing in Tapia, I don't think it's impossible or out of the question. They go out and get maybe one more left-handed at bat. But again, I don't think it's like, I don't think it's likely, even though they've already proven us wrong before, if that makes sense. So, you know, you look at it too, and you wonder what they're going to do. Do they still go with another left-handed at bat internally for the opening day roster? There's still some different possibilities they can go with here. But the one clear cut thing is that they come away from this deal is that they're getting that left-handed at bat, even though it's not the biggest name out there. It's a really good fit for his team or for him and obviously his role now with the team and for Randall Gritchick. I mean, as much as again, he wasn't necessarily the most well-liked player by everyone. Of course, some people did like him. Uh, he's going to go over in a good situation in Coors field. He's going to get an opportunity to play almost every day. Uh, he's going to be going to Coors field. We all know how that can inflate his numbers. He can easily hit upwards of 30 home runs this year. I, if you ask me uh, out at Coors field, the on-base percentage maybe might climb a little bit. So that's the one thing where they differ, uh, differentiate from each other. So I'm, I'm a really fan, a big fan of the deal, but adding Tapia, it doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, feel like they're completely done, but I'm not going to, and I'm not going to rule out that possibility. And if it's down the line, I think we all know they're going to be adding throughout the year. So it's pretty obvious that they will do that. But in terms of before opening day, I won't rule it out, but I don't think it's likely. So if they go into this with him set as their only left-handed at bat on the bench or one of the only at bats on the bench, I still think they're in a really good position. I know he's no longer a Blue Jay, and to an extent, it doesn't matter. But getting to watch him in Colorado, getting to watch any player in Colorado is fun. And getting to see how many home runs he's going to hit this year and how his numbers are really going to jump a little bit, it's fun to watch if you're a Blue Jay fan, even if he is no longer a Blue Jay. Like last season, he had 22 home runs. Um, 2019, 31 home runs, which was the most of his career. If he has the power to hit 31 home runs over a full season, I'm very excited to see what he does at Coors Field. I think he has the potential to hit as many as 40 home runs. Don't think he will. I think that's an over-exaggeration. I think he's not going to be able to repeat his 2019 success, but it's possible and it's going to be fun to fall, to watch what he does. And, you know, we are being a little bit harsh on Randall Grishik. I, I mean, you mentioned he's not a fan favorite um, or at least not Twitter fan favorite. There's a lot of people on social media that don't like him. And maybe there's another crowd that's off social media of Blue Jay fans that people actually do like him. But I think by and large, the general consensus of fans is not positive for him. But I do think we're being a bit harsh on him. I think he had a good time with the Blue Jays. You know, he's been here for four seasons. He's one of the longest tenured Blue Jays on the roster. Um, he He's almost played 500 games here. 243 batting average, yes, not great. Um, 289 OBP, not great. League average, OPS plus. Um, I think we're being a bit harsh on him. I, I think we should recognize, you know, what he's done for the Blue Jays, where he's taken the Blue Jays, how he's stayed through thick and thin. He signed that extension, that five-year extension back in 2018, 2019. And he was able to see what the Blue Jays were going to become. He, you know, you can obviously chalk it up to just getting that $50 million and being happy with that and being set for the next five years. But he was able to understand where the Blue Jays were going, what their targets were, the players they had coming up, and he stuck with it. And he's one of those guys who's been here for a very long time. So that's something that might get lost in all of this. Blue Jays have been trying to move him for a while. He's long been seen as kind of a temporary guy that's just here for – couple years before the Blue Jays move on to bigger and better things. But I think it is important to recognize what he has done for this team over the last four years. And yeah, not ideal. And you hope that the Blue Jays can improve off him with Tapia, but you got to at least be a little bit happy for him and hope he can get more regular playing time, better numbers off in Colorado. And again, Colorado, Chris Bryant. Now they got Randall Grishik. Who the hell knows what's going on there? It's going to be interesting to see what kind of season they have. 
and I will be watching eagerly to see how he performs in Colorado. Yeah, and one thing I do want to clarify is I never disliked Randall Grichik, and yeah, in the heat of the moment, I can probably yell out a, oh my God, you're trash comment or whatever, but overall, I liked him. He came over, I had never heard of him before he came to the Blue Jays, came here, and he was one of those guys. Like I think a good comparable would be Justin Smoke, where he was here with the 2015 and 16 roster and then stayed a little bit longer, was kind of like that last bit of history, if that makes any sense. And I'm not sure anybody wants to remember the 69 win season. Like that wasn't very good, but um, it, like overall, like he, he stayed here for a long time and it, you know, it was, it was enjoyable to have him on this roster. Yes. He wasn't the greatest in, you know, he wasn't elite level, but he wasn't terrible either. And I think that's, what's kind of getting lost in translation here. And at the end of the day, this is a human being that is working and I wish him nothing but the best in Colorado. I mean, he hopefully does have a chance to be the guy. And one thing I do want to remember or have everybody else remember is that he was never supposed to play as many games as he did last season. Like he only got into as many games because of Springer's injuries. And to say that, well, you didn't put up Springer numbers. That's not really fair. Like obviously he's not going to put up George Springer's type numbers. I think he was a legitimate You know, he was a good outfielder. He had flashes of brilliance. He had flashes of not brilliance uh, as a nice way to put it. But all I can say is, you know, I I hope that he does succeed in in Colorado. As you said, two more years there. I think he's in his mid mid to early 30s, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. But maybe he's got one more big payday or at least payday coming up ahead of him. And who knows, maybe, maybe going from not being the guy in Toronto to getting the chance to be the guy in Colorado is what he needed. And all we can say is, you know, it, it was fun while he was here and, and you, you do wish that he is able to at least revamp his career because he does have the talent to do it. I mean, there, I think it was 2017 right after he'd come off the IL, he was hitting like a, not even a buck 97, I think it was Oh 97. And then for like a month straight hit in the four hundreds, like we've seen what he can do, at times he just needs to be able to replicate that over a season, not 400, but at least be able to provide a team with consistency. And all I can say is I hope he can do that this season with Colorado and next season. Yeah. um, In my opinion, I guess, you know, compared to you guys, I wasn't as great of a fan as Randall Grichuk as you guys were, but that doesn't take away, obviously, the amount of games that he was here for and pretty much what he did. He filled the void last year. I'm just saying, I think sometimes we are a little bit too harsh on him. Yeah, no, that's fine. And then for me, in my opinion, yeah, I wasn't uh, the the biggest fan of him no matter what. But again, he filled his void here and he did a lot of good things here. And of, of course, last year, you can't take that away after all the time that George Springer missed. So it comes down to it again. And I'll, I'll say it again to add on to your point, Mark, about being harsh on him. I think it's about the role and it's about the fit that makes this a good deal for, I guess, both of them, because ideally, or pretty much when you think of it, if the Jays don't make this move coming into this year, uh, Randall Grichik's the fourth outfielder again. And I don't know necessarily think he, he wanted that as well. You know, he had the expect, expectation as much as if you agree or not, that he was going to play a lot, play almost every day. And with the healthy George Springer, there just wasn't room in the lineup. And you look at it this year too. We all know the expanded rosters will be happening in April to May. There's likely going to be three catches on this team. We know that Alejandro Kirk, Reese McGuire, Danny Jansen, there's going to be a cluster there too in terms of DH time. So playing times was going to be tough for Randall Grichik on this roster, I think, for the first month of the season. And of course, he was a right-handed hitter. We all know that. That's not what the Jays needed. And this is exactly what the Jays need, bringing in Tapia. So that's why as much as Grichik, um, you know, necessarily, if you liked him or not, The fit, I think, with him in Colorado, because he's going to get a chance to play every day. Uh, He's going to enjoy it a little bit more. And, Mark, you were talking about the excitement as well of players hitting at Coors Field. So good for him on that. And uh, it just comes down to the the fit at the end of the day, which is why Tapia being that left-handed at-bat, or at least one of the next left-handed at-bats they're going to bring in, it makes the Jays a lot better, I think, I guess, in terms of where they sit, as much as you want to compare the numbers or not between Grichik and Tapia, I just think in terms of the fit and the role, it's a massive win for the team, as much as you think some people may think Grichik's actually a better player offensively or whatnot. So that's that's pretty much where we are with that. And of course, you do wish nothing but the best to Randall Grichik and you wish him good luck in Colorado. So he's going to get that chance to be that everyday player that he's always wanted to do no matter where it was. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if he can, if he can crack uh, 30 home runs this year. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Tapia specifically, because 
I think he brings something to this team that the Blue Jays don't really have right now, and that's speed. Um, the Blue Jays do have it to some extent. You know, Bo Bichette is active on the base pass. They got some younger guys that are right now getting time in spring training. Who knows whether they actually play a role with the team, but, you know, Santiago Espinal is another one of those guys that does have that speed that contributes to the Blue Jays. But by and large, they don't have a lot of those guys, and they don't have guys with elite speed. Like, Bo Bichette, is a bat for a shortstop, good defense, who has speed on the side. Santiago Espinal is a defensive first infielder that has an all right bat that's subject to debate. I know, Jacob, you're really high on what he does uh, offensively, and speed is a byproduct of all that stuff. I think Ramel Tapia, all things combined, his good offensive numbers, or at least you know comparable to Randall Grishik offensive numbers, all those things combined, he is a guy where speed is one of his top tools. And I think that's something that adds to the Blue Jays that the Blue Jays don't have, and it complements their lineup a lot. You can slide him in there, and he's, uh, in addition to being a left-handed bat, he diversifies what the Blue Jays offer. If he gets on base, he's going to cause problems. If he's playing as a fourth outfielder and the Blue Jays enter a situation in the 10th inning, now that we know that ghost runners are coming back for 2022, he can be that pinch runner who's on second base and provides that speed that the Blue Jays need if he's not starting. So I think what he brings to this team, in addition to being a left-handed bat, in addition to providing, you know, league average, maybe a little bit above league average offense as a fourth outfielder, he also brings speed, which diversifies the Blue Jays lineup. I think that's something that's really important in this deal for the Blue Jays. Randall Grishik, not a guy who has speed at all. You know, he's all right defensively in center field, but I think Tepia is good defensively and brings that all-important speed factor. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays in the Blue Jays lineup. Um, I mentioned the money a little bit. Um, right now, it's looking like the Blue Jays are getting about $7 million of wiggle room in the budget. We don't know the exact number because they are sending cash considerations with Grishik over to Colorado. So it might be more like 6 million might be more like 5 million. Don't know the exact number, but I think the blue Jays now do have a little bit more money to play with. If they want to make another deal, if they want to go after someone like Michael Conforto, although this deal might take that off the table, if they want to go after someone, like I mentioned last episode, Jed Lowry, if that's someone they want to pursue, they have the extra money to do that. So I think that's another ramification of this deal. Um, I know we said that, you know, it, the Blue Jays are kind of searching for the needle in the haystack now. They're kind of searching for those minor league guys, those major league veterans who haven't signed yet, those small type deals. But is there still a possibility that the Blue Jays make a big deal? There were people on Twitter that were speculating that this deal is only part of a bigger picture move for the Blue Jays because Tapia in and of himself doesn't, totally solve what the Blue Jays need from the left-handed side. Like he's a bat, he's major league average, but he's not an impact bat. He's not someone that you're going to be scared of when you're facing in the lineup. He's someone that in this lineup, odds are he's batting seventh, eighth, maybe sixth on a good day. He's not an impact bat. So is there still room for the Blue Jays to make a deal for Michael Conforto? Um, make a deal for my favorite guy, Jed Lowry? Is there still room for the Blue Jays to make a move in that regard? One thing I do want to say is if you are Cleveland, who is more enticing to you as part of a package? Is it Randall Grichik or is it Raymond Tapia? Now, I'm not saying that they're going to go out and, and get Jose Ramirez, but if I'm, if I'm the Blue Jays, if I'm throwing in Alejandro Kirk, I don't know, Jordan Groshans, maybe Jordan, not Jordan Groshans, but you're throwing in a top pick, and Raymond Tapia, and I, I don't know who else Cleveland would want, maybe Biggio, I mean, anything more I think would be a little too much. But I think that, you know, if you, you can afford to still get rid of Tapia, and maybe this is not the correct take, but if you get rid of him in a Jose Ramirez trade, I think Josh Palacios would be a fair fourth outfielder. I'm just saying, like, it, it could happen. I, I now, Let me put this on the record. I think it's very unlikely that anything like this happens because I feel like the big moves are done, but I'm just saying like it, it, things could be under the radar. Something could pop up in July, close to the end of July where 
the Blue Jays say, hey, look what this guy did for us during the season. Look what he is capable of doing. Here's part of our deal. But other than that, in terms of like the immediate future, it, I mean, I, I still think that they are kind of done. I don't really think that you're going to go out, out and get a Jed Lowry or Michael Conforto or really anybody because like realistically, un- unless if you bring in Jed Lowry, he's going to have to beat out, I think, Santiago Espinal and or Greg Bird to make the roster. Now, he definitely could beat out Greg Bird. I think Espinal's more of a lock, but it, it's it's going to be a lot harder to bring one of those guys in just knowing that for the most part, your roster is set. So I think like the wiggle room with the money, I think it's going to help them in the future, whether that's six months down the line, whether that's at the off season, but it, I don't think that it's necessarily for a right now move unless it's part of a much bigger picture that we don't know about yet. I think it's got to be pretty much kind of uh, part one of a bigger move to come. I think it has to be in order for this trade to work out even more than it does. You know, I, again, you were talking about Espinal and um, Greg Bird making the team. Who's going to get the advantage. I mean, Right now, I still think both of them uh, are going to be on this roster if they don't make any more moves is where they stand. Because what I mentioned before, that the roster is going to be 28 people in April to May. So that's one thing we got to look at is that we're going to have a bigger roster than usual here. But it's just, I think as much as the trade looks good for the Jays, I think right now, you want to put it even more, I guess, in your favor by getting one more piece or, you know, setting something up for something to happen in the future. And I think that's what will probably be a lot more acceptable as well. So what that is, I'm not sure, but it's just, it's, it's hard to say because we were looking at this roster two days ago and we were saying that we were all in a really good spot if they ended up, or they, they were, they kind of stopped making any moves. Now Ross Atkins said he was comfortable too, as much as he was going to explore making the team better, which he clearly wasn't even lying about when you look at that. And the, the other report too, was that, the Jays were working on this deal pretty much since last November that it was reported during the, uh, the winter meetings. But I think also the Jays declined an offer until talks uh, resumed to Randall Gritchick. I saw that. So this is something that they've been envisioning for a long time, which makes me wonder that as much as they wanted uh, Tapia for a long time, they're still exploring their other options. And I think that there's still room here to make another deal. And, if, and Mark, you were talking about the relief that they make giving up the Gritcha contract. It's about 7 million, like you said, or at least we're kind of estimating because we don't know for sure. You know, that you really have to look, I think, at making an, another move. And if you don't, then you're going to be in a position where, and this isn't, I guess, the worst thing to start the year as much if you agree or not with me. I think, again, there's Greg Bird, there's other options out there, but internally right now is the only solution, I think, for the, the last couple of roster spots unless they continue to go out there and get something else. So that's all I'm saying right now. They're good. They're in a good spot, I think with the trade, but to make it even more of a beneficial for you, I think you got to go out and make another move. And if that's another outfielder, if that's another infielder, whoever that is another reliever, it, it all depends on what it is, but I think they have something up their sleeve. And that's the one thing we've gotten to learn from this front office is that these guys plan three steps ahead um, of everything, you know, as much as you look at it now and you're like, what are they doing? And some people are, what, what are you doing with this? What's the end game with this? I think they have an idea of what they're planning to do. And I don't think this is the final piece. I, I really don't, but if it is before the, the start of the year, it is what it is. We all know they're going to add throughout the year, which is pretty much a lock, but I just think we have to learn that the front office is pretty much planned for this clearly months in advance. I mean, if we're going back to November here when they were talking about Tapia, then clearly they, they know what they're doing or they have some sort of plan in mind or plan in motion. So I'll get who reported that as well before, or while I send it back over to you, Mark, but I thought that was really interesting that this is something that they've looked at even prior to um, pretty much the lock, the the lockout ending. So that's the one thing. And you do mention a really good point about his speed. Like he, he stole 20 bases last year. And that's something that you've rarely seen on this team throughout the past, what, almost like five years. Of course, you have a few guys here and there that have shown flashes that can run the bases. We we know there's been guys like Ben Revere. There's been guys like Dalton Pompey in years past. And I'm forgetting a couple other guys, obviously. So even before those 2015 days. So that's one thing that they, they've kind of been lacking the past couple of years uh, specifically. But now they're getting that in Tapia. And, you know, again, he played 130 games last year. It would be ideal if he played a lot less than that. And I envision if everything goes as planned with everyone's health, it will be less than that because we all know the team is coming over from, from the Rockets to the Jays playing time is going to be a little bit more tough for him here, but the role for him on this team, I'll say it one more time as a fourth outfielder, 
you have to like you have to like the move you do and the, the flexibility that he has is as a left-handed at bat he doesn't strike out a lot he's a tough at bat as much as his power isn't there and that's pretty much the one i guess a uh, weak point of his game clearly his numbers show that his slugging percentage uh, was pretty much I think below almost 400 so the OPS though as much as the the slugging percentage was low was just under 700 so that gives you an, an idea of how much he does get on base and how much him getting on base makes up for that so and there's lots of other things as well you know his the outfield as well he's pretty good at, I mentioned at the beginning of the the podcast his DRS was really good last year as well so that's what we'll pretty much wait to see I think his opening day approaches. I want to envision they make another deal, but I just, it, I'm very torn on if they are or not, but I still think even if they're done before opening day, there's something down the road that they have planned. And I really do think that. You've touched on a tiny bit, George Springer. Um, in the case of a George Springer injury, knock on wood and pray it does not happen because if it does, we are going to be in for an entirely it's different not good. season than what we're anticipating. But I think the one thing that makes me nervous about this deal is despite all the praise we've heaped on Tapia, I think I would still be more comfortable in the case of a George Springer injury with a Randall Grishik starting every day in center field than Ramiel Tapia starting every day in center field. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. It's just in my mind, I think Grishik is – a steadier option despite you know how hot and cold he can run I think he's a steadier option in my mind from what I know about Tapia you know just reading his baseball reference page and baseball savant page I think he has a very high ceiling but there is the potential for a low floor there like you look at his stats over the last few seasons um, and we've gone over it like 273 batting average last season and then 321 in 2020. Um, you know, I think there's a, a big range that he can fall into. And I'm not sure I'm so confident with that as a starting center fielder. I also think he has less experience in the majors than Randall Grishik does. I mean, he has 439 career games. Grishik has more than that with only the Blue Jays. And we know he played a couple of years in St. Louis before that. So I think that's the one reservation I have about this deal is in the case of injury, we might be stuck with a less than ideal situation but that's kind of something we just have to live with at this point now that the deal is official so i'm going to agree with you on that however and this might be naive of me but i have a feeling that what happened last season is a complete anomaly it could be i it could be that i'm completely wrong and it could be that springer or somebody else whether i don't want to throw names into existence here but whether somebody gets injured and you end up needing to rely on Tapia and even someone like Josh Palacios, but like that can't happen every single year. Like it, it's, I don't think Springer's actually missed much time ever in his career. Like this was really the one anomaly in his career. So I think it's fair to say that yes, Grichik is a better long-term option in terms of a season, but I, I really don't see that needing to be the case this year. And really, I mean, look at it, the Springer, if you want to look at how the Blue Jays handled Springer's situation, it was the oblique injury that he came back a little too early for, re-aggravated it, missed two months, I think it was. Then it was the the quad, then it was the knee. Like, so pretty much like except the oblique was the main issue for him where it was just re-aggravated. And I really don't see any situation where the Blue Jays are even a little bit doubtful on his health or anyone's health really for that matter after what we saw last season where they were one game short of a playoff spot. So in an ideal world, yeah, you have Grichuk as an everyday guy if need be, but I really don't see that being a situation. And I hope that's not the situation because I mean, heck the blue Jays are paying Springer like $25 million. So you want to see that put to good use. And especially as a fan, you know, you want to see deep into October, this team still playing. So I, I think it's fair to say that that's what we're going to see really for the majority of, if not all of 2022 is, is, at least a healthy roster. Now I'm not saying that injuries are not going to happen. Obviously you'd hope that, but in terms of missing that much time, missing half of a season or more than half a season, I think that's very unlikely. And that's why I think the blue Jays are confident enough to really to move on from Grichik and make a move like this. Yeah. You know, we talk about the fit. We talk about how Tapia is better in this roster because of the way he hits and because just everything that we've discussed, we're all talking about that based on, you know, the best case scenario that there isn't a, ma a major injury specifically to George Springer, who unfortunately lost a bunch of time last year because of that. So 
that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario was what you were talking about, Mark. If George Springer has another season like he did last year where he misses a significant time, you know, he plays under 100 games, something like that. Uh, I, I'm a little, I'm pretty worried. Uh, I'm not going to lie because yes, it's a less steady option for sure. Randall Gritchick was the one who filled that void last year, as we were talking about before or earlier on in the show, which is why, you know, hit him gone. Now you have Tapia who doesn't have a lot of experience to begin with. I think in the major leagues at all in center field, he's more experienced in the corner outfielders. You have Teoscar Hernandez, who I think would be the next guy up in terms of a backup center fielder area it's it's not a very good or ideal void if George Springer's out for that long so yes this is a gamble in a way because the Jays have to assume and it's pretty clear cut obvious that George Springer needs to be healthy this year for this to work out and that's pretty much there's nothing else to it so clearly they're optimistic that this was a one-off like you guys were saying as well that you know because of his track record it's not to there's no reason to believe that this is going to be consistent throughout the next couple of years because last year in particular was the most injury plague season he's had or at least one of uh throughout his entire career so that's where i look at it as well but yeah tapia and the other thing too is as much as he played in 133 games last year and his numbers looked good and all that you know who knows if he can replicate that again i mean you're moving away from coors field full time you're going to be going uh away from that we we really don't know if he's going to replicate it to that extent of course, hopefully it's something around there, but it's hard, it's hard to guarantee that he's going to be that good or even better. So that's the other thing and the other concern I have because as a, four, a fourth outfielder, it's perfect. But if we're missing an outfielder like that where he's got to play almost every day, it's less than ideal in my opinion. So, And that's also hence for me to believe that they might not be done and they might be adding more throughout the uh, the next couple of weeks, maybe into the season a little bit. And of course, I guess the the end game of this is in July. So Uh, That's pretty much where I sit on it. And to pretty much clarify what I said before about the Blue Jays being interested um, in Tapia prior to the lockout. The report came from Ethan Diamond Das. He's a Blue Jays reporter for uh, in Ottawa, sports reports for Ottawa. So he's the one who reported that. Just wanted to clarify that. So and then the other thing is too, um, Adrian Pinto, who the Jays got, I guess the other prospect, as much as he wasn't on that top prospect list uh, for the Rockies, you know, it seems like there's a lot of excitement around him and pretty good that the Jays got another prospect like this. The only, uh, obvi- the only obvious downfall I have is that he's 19 years old and you don't really know much about him and a lot can change between um, here and there. So that's where I look at it from that as well. But it's interesting. I, I really do. Uh, it, it shocked me, obviously, this move, but I really do like the idea and the mindset behind it because of the role and the fit. Even if you want to make the case that Randall Gritchick, yes, could be a better hitter could be more steady in the outfield every day. It's a gamble. I think a small gamble in a way, but of course there's a really good scenario where this turns out, but there's also a really bad scenario. So all of us have to hope that George Springer is okay this year. It was a one-off in terms of his knee, his oblique, his quad. Um, Hopefully that was a one-off. And again, moving forward to uh, this year, you have to imagine that him being healthy is going to be even more impactful because we didn't even see that a lot last year, which is, Hence why I'm even more excited this year as well, because we're assuming that we're going to be getting him uh, full time uh, this year in center field. So that's where I really look at it from that. And uh, Rymel Tapia, I mean, welcome. Like, I really do hope. And, you know, nothing is more exciting to me is when people like to steal bases and the Jays have those, you know, one or two guys on the roster who are really fast. So he's going to have a lot of, I guess, responsibilities of him starting the odd time, coming off the bench, being a pinch hitter, maybe sometimes being a pinch runner for sure. Most of the time you were talking about the the extra innings role where the runner on second base has returned uh, for this year, at least, at least. So that's why there's a lot of um, different roles that Tapia can have as much as him just starting games the odd time. He's going to be very flexible off the bench, uh, regardless if he's hitting or if he's running. Couple numbers to throw out here. Before we end the podcast, the first one, you were mentioning Tapia's lack of experience in center field. Career games, mentioned it earlier, 329 total career defensive games, according to uh, baseball reference. 37 games in center field. So he's not experienced at all in center field. His main position is left field. And then the other number I want to throw out there, Randall Grishik. 89 OPS plus in 2021 Randall or Raymel Tapia 80 OPS plus in 2021. So just to put those two things out there, I know we're talking about this deal in a generally positive light, but 
I think there are reasons to be concerned and why I don't think any of us are like truly in love with this deal and truly in love with what Tapia has to offer for the Blue Jays yet. Again, depends on so many other variables, but I I can see how, you know, if I was rating this deal of a hundred, I might give it a 65. If a hundred is love this deal, absolutely adore it. And zero is I hate this. I detest it. I might give it 65, 70 area. I think it is overall a positive addition for the Blue Jays, but there are some reasons to be concerned and some reasons why it's not a perfect deal for them. But again, and we're ignoring the fact that they get a prospect in all this. They get Adrian Pinto, who is the only thing I know about him after a quick Google search is that he's five foot six. So what is not to love? Uh, but okay, we will wrap up this podcast there. Thank you to everyone who listened. Um, we got 15 days till opening day. So it's a very exciting time. Um, as always, you can support our podcast on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash section 138 pod and exciting new development. We are on TikTok now. Um, it took us long enough. We finally caved in. I don't think any of us are huge TikTok fans, but we decided to join the party. So you can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at section 138 pod. We're doing lots of fun, exclusive content that's only showing up there. So be sure to check that out. And with that, we will see you next time we record. Who knows when that is? Who knows when we'll have news? See you then. One and one on Jose. All eyes on the mound and the bearded Sam Dyson. Now he comes set. Kicks the 1 1 pitch. Five ball deep left field. Yes, sir. There she goes.